Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. Clap your hands and give God a praise. Amen. You may have your seats. We honor the Lord today for all of his excellent mercies. We honor the Lord because he is God. And beside him, there is no other. And we honor him most of all because he loves us. And he loves us so much that he made provision for us to spend eternity in his presence. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad about that. There's not too many people I, you want to spend eternity with. And those are the people we know. But God says, I want to spend eternity with you. Eternity. Eternity. And so I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Hallelujah. We honor uh, the master prophet um, and his help me, prophetess Deborah, happy birthday. Uh, we are grateful to you for your leadership and for our friendship. Bishop Jordan and I have become talking partners. Yeah. And we get on the phone and we stay on the phone for an hour talking about everything that is going on and I so appreciate him because we share a mutuality in that we spark each other's juices and our mental capacities and makes us think about all of these things and uh, so many different things. And so I am grateful to him and to Pastor and to the family of Zoe. Uh, to my family, Reverend Doctor, where did he go? Where's my, fa my father? Oh, he stepped out for a moment and my mom, so grateful to you and for them being here. Now, I, I did give him instructions <laughs> because he and my mother, if you don't give them instructions, they will incite, recite my entire resume <laughs> from the first job I ever had. Uh, and so I just said, keep it brief. Keep it brief. Just, you know, edit. Edit. <laughs> Uh, so, so, yes, he is correct that I give him instructions, but I will tell you one of the lessons I learned. I am an adjutant at my heart, and that is how I was trained. But the key to being an adjutant is to be unseen. Yes. The best adjutants are never in the pictures. Wow. You don't know that they're giving the instructions. And so I have attempted to live that out with him. And so you don't know I'm giving him instructions unless he tells you I'm giving him instructions. And that is the joy of my life, really, is to see things run without anybody knowing that I'm running them. Amen? Amen. So many people want to, especially these days, want to be in the limelight. Everything's on Instagram. Everything's on your whole entire... I'm like, why are people telling all of this... Do, you, I don't really, do we really need to know what you have for breakfast today? What's that about? And sometimes, you know, like the hand of God, you got to move in secret and in quiet. Amen. So I also want to recognize the Jeffries, uh, Dr. Roslyn and Dr. Leonard. We love you so much. You have been compatriots of our family and of our church and of our movement, and we stand on your shoulders and are so grateful to God for you and for your witness. And to all of you, the company of prophets and my brothers and sisters in the gospel, and as I'm shouting out my family, I want to shout out my in love family, the guys, Sarah and Mommy, and uh, Sarah married my my oldest nephew, Lorenzo, and now we ha I have a grandniece, Lauren Joy, who only talks to me when I have on robes. <laughs> Other than that, she ignores me. It's terrible. But if I had a robe on today, I might get a hug, I might get a hug but I didn't wear a robe, so I'm just out of luck today. But we love Sarah, and we thank you to the Zoe family for allowing me to borrow Sarah when I was serving as CEO of the 2016 convention, and Sarah walked with me for those two years, and I am grateful. 
grateful to Zoe for letting her go and to Pastor Deborah for letting her let me steal her and to Sarah for making coming and making order of my life. So I'm grateful to you today to have this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Those of you who carry the gifting and the mantle of prophetic authority and responsibility. We pray for you that God will continue to undergird and guide you so that you may continue to be God's voice for the people whom you are called to serve and for this time in which you live. Indeed, this is why we have come to talk about the times in which we live and your prophetic responsibility in this moment. We hope to encourage you and bless the work of your hands. And we hope to challenge you and inspire you as you pursue the perfecting of your gift. The theme of your gathering is, let's see here. The theme of your gathering is perfecting the eye and building on that, I want to use as my theme for today, do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? So where shall we begin? With scripture, of course. Revelation 19.10 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That is to say that true prophecy centers around Jesus. His divinity, his mission and his ministry, his purpose, and his imminent return to the earth. True prophecy points saint and sinner alike toward Jesus by his name or by his precepts, example, and standard. Prophecy does not create new canon, new law, or new standards. It affirms the canon as God sent it, the law as God created it, and the standards as God set it. Through exhortation, through admonition, through encouragement or inspiration, prophecy always calls us higher. Higher to God's will. Higher to God's way. Higher to God's word. Higher from where we are to where God wants us to be. Higher from our vision of ourselves to God's vision of who we are higher from our current situations and circumstances to God's design for our lives. Higher, higher. Prophecy calls us higher, always higher, helping us to see a future of God's design and a destiny of God's creation, helping us to see our lives and our worlds through the prism of God's promises, helping us to see helping us to see by holding forth a vision and continually pushing us, pulling us, prodding us to see that vision and asking the question, do you see what I see? The vision of the prophet must be sharper and clearer than the vision of the people they serve. The voice of the prophet must be bolder and stronger than the voices of the culture from which the prophet is called. This is imperative. It's not a choice. It's a mandate. After all, the prophet is a living, breathing, doing model of the will, the way, and the word of God. And the job of the prophet is to remind us continually, without ceasing, of the promise of the reign of God, the values and the standards of that reign, and then to challenge us to believe, adhere, and live those values, those standards, even and especially in the face of a dominant culture which calls us to do otherwise. So what do I mean? Let me give you a practical example, a few uh, years ago on social media and in the, in, the, in the ether, the common phrase was YOLO. Everybody's walking around, you're talking about YOLO. Y-O-L-O, YOLO, you only live once. 
And it was, it, was an, it was meant to be an encouragement for people to, to test their boundaries and to try new things and to, you know, experience new, new, new ideas. But it, it went farther than that and began to encourage reckless behavior, amoral and immoral behavior under the name of you only live once. I'm going to do it because, you know, you only live once. That's not my husband, but you know he only live once. That doesn't belong to me, but you only live once. And we, I listen to the people of God fall into that. YOLO, you only live once. Try it, you only live once. And it rankled my spirit because I said, you only live once. No, I'm living to live again. The decisions I make today impact how I live in heavenly places. The words that I say today impact my future. This is not about a temporary life bound by the number of years I'm granted on earth. This is about my eternal existence, so no, no YOLO for me. We have to challenge these dominant messages that are coming from the culture that are at odds with the word and the will of God. And they are insidious and they seep their way in to our consciousness. And before you know it, we look like, we sound like, and we move like the world. The job of the prophet is to remind us of what our standards should be. That's why on the opening slide I used the plumb line. Y'all know about a plumb line? The ancient symbol of prophecy which shows what is truly straight which shows what the straight line is, and then you know if you're leaning or not. My grandfather was a carpenter, and they used the level. So you think it's straight because your eye tells you it's straight, but then you put the level up, then you say, oh, no, it's not straight. It's leaning a little bit. That's who we have to be as prophets, the plumb line that says, no, 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 no. You're leaning a little bit. Come back into alignment with the word of God. Say amen, somebody. Do you see what I see? So the task of the prophetic, the eye of the prophet is sharpened by the prophet's realization and acceptance that their task is, as Walter Brueggemann, a well-known theologian, so aptly describes it, their, pro their task is twofold, criticizing and energizing. Criticizing and energizing. Criticizing, that is to invigorate, or, 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 or you can see it on the slide here, a rejection and delegitimization of the present ordering of things. A rejection and a delegitimization of the present order of things. The prophet says what it is now is not what it's supposed to be. God is calling us to a different standard. Our task as prophets is to criticize what's happening now. It challenges the people of God and the community of faith to assess the current culture and their current situation through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How does this match up? How does this line up with what the gospel says? And it produces a critique of your personal situation, but also of the culture. And it rejects anything that's not like God. The prophet calls us to critique. The prophet calls us to measure by what the scripture says. Measure what's happening in our lives, in our homes, in our communities, but also what's happening in the world. Is this like God or not? Would God be pleased with this or not? Would God be front row seat to this show or not? That's the job of the prophet, criticizing, pushing us to critique. The other end of that is energizing. The job of the prophet is to energize, to invigorate people, to invigorate the community by the promise of what God, by the reminder of the promise of what God is going to do and deliver in the future. You gotta have hope. 
the prophet reminds us of the hope. It gives hope to God's people and the community of faith by reminding them of the ideals and the promise which have been articulated where in the scripture and the certainty that whatever God promises, he's able to perform. The prophet holds these things in tension. There is the critique, but there is also the promise. Too much of one or the other is an imbalance. And this is important for us to understand because it helps to explain what we are seeing in the church today, particularly as it relates to our white evangelical brothers and sisters. In the white evangelical circles, their emphasis is on the energizing. Jesus is coming. Everything's going to be better. Let's not worry about what's happening with racism and sexism because God's going to fix all of that in the future. God's going to take care of that. When we all get to heaven, it's going to all be great. They focus on the energizing. They focus on the hope. They don't want to do no work. They will just want to do the hoping. Wow. They just want to push you to the future to when it's all going to get better. But they don't want to talk about how it gets better. Yeah. On the other side, in the far left, liberal circles, they don't want to talk about the hope. They just want to talk about what's wrong. It's all about social justice, but social justice for the sake of the struggle, for the sake of the march, for the sake of the rally, for the sake of the critique, and not getting ever to where it's going to get better. They just want to march to march, march for march's sake, march because it's time to march. There's always an issue. They're always mad about something. And I'm a child of the movement. I've been on more marches and rallies than most people. I have made my signs, I have marched across the bridge, I have shouted into a bullhorn, all of that. But it came from our place as a prophetic people that we were doing this to move us to the future where God's promises would be realized in our lives right here on earth. So while the white folks and the white evangelicals want to hold us to the future and hold, tell us to just be quiet, it's all going to be better by and by. By and by when the morning comes. Or by and by, pie in the sky, by and by, while the oppressor gets theirs now. And where the liberals stand, the far left liberals, you just want to march in a rally and with no consciousness of God, with no consciousness of the hope of eternity. And where do we stand? Where do we stand? Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. This helps us to understand this. Revelation 19.10, the spirit, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of God, is the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony of Jesus, his presence, his ministry, and his word spoke both to the people in the time in which he lived and also a time yet to come. After all, in his own person, he is, he was, and he is to come. What we see in the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, is the lived balancing of what I call the axis of prophetic leadership. The axis of prophetic leadership. And I submit to you that those with the prophetic mantle stand at the center of this axis and the fulfillment of your ministry mandate depends on how well you understand and balance the demands of this axis. The axis of prophetic leadership is the intersection of three areas of tension. And by tension, I mean two seemingly opposite or seemingly contradictory values, ideas, or schools of thought that we seek to struggle with, manage, control, or bring into balance. Let me tell you what I mean. The first area, the one we are most familiar with, is the tension of time. At one end is the present where we stand at this moment, and at the other is the future, 
We are keenly aware of how the decisions we make in the present impact our outcomes in the future. The decisions I make today with Dr. Womack about how I fuel my body or how I use my resources will have a tangible and direct impact on my tomorrow. That's where most people are. They have a hope for the future, and whether it's planning Aunt Sally's 75th birthday party, or being able to take a vacation this summer, or having the resources to pay for their children's college, they make reasonable plans to try and get them to their goals. Profits, on the other hand, start from the future. They start from a place of destiny and work backward to the present. Yes, 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 yes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, 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 yes. So you heard earlier that I've been the uh, CEO of two Democratic conventions. I'm the only person in American history to hold the job twice. Wow. People say... People often say that my two conventions, the Obama convention and the Clinton convention, were the best conventions the Democratic Party has ever had. And when I'm interviewed and people say, well, what makes your conventions different? How do you, how, what did you do? How did you use all a million and one pieces that have to be knit together before you see it on television? It takes about 18 months to plan. You have to actually move to the city. So I moved to Philadelphia, I moved to Denver in order to uh, plan the convention. And I said, well, you know, I'm really good at putting together teams. I'm really good with details. I love all the little pieces and how they fit together. That's my public answer, but for church folk. <laughs> it is where my anointing in the gift of prophecy ah. and in the, in the prophetic mantle comes into place because I see the end. Yes, yes, yes. I start with the end and how I want the convention to look, yes. how I want the convention to feel, how I want people to walk away from that experience, and then I walk it back. Come on. Because I've already, see, I started in the future. Come on. And then I walk it back. And the gifts, the supernatural gifts that the Lord has blessed me with a prophecy and the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge wrap themselves together and allow me to make manifest the vision that the Lord gave me for how the convention ought to operate. It also filters into how my office operates with the spirit of integrity, the spirit of respect, so that everybody who comes to work for me knows they're going to have a good experience, they're going to be respected, they're going to be loved. We don't talk about love in the workplace. They're going to be loved, and they're going to be told the truth. They might not like the truth. They might not always like what I have to say, but it's going to be, but you, they can walk away knowing it's the truth. And it comes from a place of respect. And that frees people to be the best that they can be in the workplace. So that means I build teams that are destined for success because they walk into the workplace understanding I expect success. I've already seen success, now you just gotta line up. You just have to walk into it. Am I making sense, y'all getting my point? Because I started in the future. And then I walked it back. I call this an area of tension in the access of prophetic leadership because the prophet must skillfully balance both present and future to be a timely and effective voice and representative of the Most High God. Too much emphasis on the present opposes the very intent of the prophetic and negates the future purposes of the Most High. And too much emphasis on the future leaves you, as the old folks say, so heavenly minded you know earthly good. This is the tension of time. The second area of tension is the tension of focus. The tension of focus. 
And that is the balance of when to comfort and when to challenge. When to comfort and when to challenge. On one end, we see Jesus, our example, actively engaged in the work of comforting and healing the people and the community to which he had been sent. On the other hand, we see Jesus undertaking the work of challenging and confronting saint, sinner, and system. In this tension, the prophet is balancing the work of comfort, guidance, and inspiration with the call to challenge and confront demonic attitudes and practices. I know some of y'all need a scripture, so let me give you a scripture. <laughs> Let's talk about the woman at the well. She came to the well to draw water. No one knew what her challenge was, but what we knew she had a challenge because she came to draw water in the middle of the day at noon, at the hottest point of the day. She's out doing the hardest work. She didn't come when the other women came in the early morning hours. When they, when, they, when they came with their buckets in the cool of the day before their day got started and the sisters went together and you know they talked a little bit and laughed a little bit and commiserated and all of that, but she wasn't part of that. There's a reason, we don't know why, but sisters, we can speculate. There was a reason she didn't feel comfortable or perhaps she wasn't made to feel comfortable to be in the company of the women in the morning. So she came in the middle of the day at the hot point to draw her water and there was Jesus. And she proceeded and they proceeded to have a conversation and where's your husband? Oh, she told him, well, you know, home. He said, that's not your husband and you have five others. Confronting, confronting her situation, making sure she knew he understood the truth, right? Because he could have just let that go. He could have just let her response, but he knew in order for her salvation, her situation had to be confronted. Yes. She had to understand that she wasn't hiding anything from anybody. And that the, that the, these, the, the five husbands, whether they were her husbands or somebody else's husbands, were creating this situation where she was coming to the well at the hot, in the heat of the day. But he didn't leave her there. He said, go and sin no more. And she goes into the village and what does she, she becomes a witness. Come see a man who told me all of my life. And so a new community of faith was built at the point of his confrontation. So he, he spoke to her situation. He called her out for the challenges that she had had in her life, but then he heals her. He comforts and he challenges. You with me? Yes. So this is the challenge of this access. Let's talk about the woman caught in adultery. Similar situation, they, the mysterious, always unnamed they. Yeah. I hate when people do that. You know what they said? They said, Pastor, they said, who's they? If you can't tell me who they is, go right back where you came from. Because God doesn't operate in a they. People have a name. And if you have an accusation, let's hear it. Don't go, you know, you don't know how we do. This woman was caught in adultery, and the scripture says they brought her to Jesus and laid her at his feet. She was caught in adultery, and the law says she must be stoned. Now, my question has always been, how they know she was caught in adultery? She was caught, was they there? She was caught in, the, were you in the room? Because unless you were in the room, and unless it was with you, everything else is hearsay. So they bring her and lay her at the feet of Jesus. She was caught in the, and the law says she must be stoned. Jesus doesn't look up. He just keeps writing in the sand. I always want to know what Jesus was writing. 
My theory is he was writing their names. <laughs> their names and their sins. And he said, he who's out sin, Peter, Jimmy, James, John, he who's out, let him cast the first stone. And they all dropped their stones and walked away. And he looked up and said, what happened? What happened to the people? What happened to the they? And she said, they gone. He said, go and sin no more. In that moment, he confronted, he comforted a woman who was about to be killed yeah. on the on say so of a they. Yeah. But he challenged this system yes. that these men were operating under that were going to have them kill a woman based on hearsay. He had to put it in their face, Jean. Walter, he who is without the sin, cast the first stone. He challenged their system of thinking, their system of religiosity and strict adherence to the law without understanding the context in which the law was written and forced them to step back. That is the tension we, he comforted and healed while challenging and confronting. He comforted and healed physical and emotional wounds among the people while confronting the systems, personal, meaning mental and familial, and society that produced the wounds in the first place. People's wounds don't come out of nowhere. People's wounds are the result of something that has happened. Sometimes in their family, sometimes in their own minds, sometimes in the society in which they live. And so the prophet has to balance the need to comfort. The scripture says that's why the prophet was called, right? To exhort, to, to, to inspire. And then there's the need to challenge. How do we balance those two things? The third area of tension is the tension of audience. Wow. Who exactly is the prophet's audience? This area of tension of balance seeks to affirm that the prophet is called to serve the individual, person, and the nation. To give voice to the spirit of God in personal spaces and in the public square to speak on issues of personal and public holiness, to call both sinner and government to repentance. The prophet Elijah went to the woman and said, make me a cake. And she says, all I have is a cruise of oil and two sticks, and I'm gonna make this cake for me and my son and we gonna die. And the prophet presses her, and as we know, she blesses the prophet with the cake, and he tells her, get the, get the cruise, gather all the jars you can, get them filled, and she did exactly that. And he said, you will live all the rest of your days in prosperity, because what he created an economic system for her, where she could sell the oil and take care of herself. He healed her situation by ministering to this one person, her family and her community was blessed with the economic enterprise that he had created for her. At the same time, we know that Elijah was in a war with Jezebel because of the unjust system that Jezebel had manifested in the kingdom, which was creating the kind of poverty and lack that caused this woman to only have a cruise of oil and two sticks. It wasn't just about the woman's personal pain, but understanding that the cause of her poverty was what was what happening in government. Was Jezebel's self-centeredness? Because you know Jezebel, and Jezebel is one of my favorite topics. 
Because Jezebel's not about red lipstick. I know I'm, born in, I'm born and raised Pentecostal, so we grew up that, you know, Jezebel was about red lipstick and long nails and too short skirt and the suit was too tight. And so you, if you, you came in there with too much eyeshadow, you had the spirit of Je Jezebel. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's what they told us. But what I came to realize as I studied Jezebel is Jezebel's not about red lips. Jezebel is about a challenge to leadership. Jezebel came into the kingdom as a princess. She was already royalty. So she came with her understanding of what royalty looks like. And she married a king, so she just figured, I'm going to just keep on being royalty. But she moved into a new place with new rules and a new situation that served the Most High God. And her and her 400 gods of Baal was at odds with the current system. So what she was trying to do was stand up to her husband and say, no, you're going to do it my way. I'm the queen and you're the king, but let me challenge your authority in the nation and what you believe in. This one God thing is not working for me. Let me show you a new way. Let me produce something. So I'm going to have all these gods and all these altars and all of these bell ringing and blood slinging. And that's what Jezebel's about. Elijah challenges her. You will not come into the kingdom of God with all of this foolishness and shenanigans. This is not our way. And you will not challenge the king who is a believer with things that are not of our belief system. He challenged Jezebel's use of her authority, her taking of her land. He challenged her use of her authority. And for that, she had a death threat out on him. And the Bible tells us, as you know, that she killed all the prophets. Here you see Elijah healing the woman. His audience was the one lone woman. All he wanted was a cake and all she had was some oil. He dealt with her personal situation and then left there and had to deal with Jezebel. Deal with the king and the queen in their court and their unjust use of power. Dr. Womack yesterday was talking about our health and our food and, and, and to bring it to a modern day, he told, he started listing all these foods we supposed to eat. I didn't know what half of those foods were. I've been around the world, he was naming things. I said, what in the ham sandwich is that? I don't know that, that food and that food. And he's right to challenge us about our health and about the sin of gluttony and the sin of lust of the eyes that gets us into trouble with our health. But the other part of that on the prophetic axis is challenging the governmental systems that have food deserts in our community where we can't get no fresh vegetables, where our only option is Popeyes and McDonald's. We can't eat right if we wanted to. And why should we have to go three communities over to find some lettuce? That is a challenge of the prophet to the system, to the nation that has created this inequity. So while the prophet is telling us, you need to do better about your body, after all, it is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And your temple is breaking down, broke down, doors busted. You need to do better with the temple of the Holy Ghost. We also have to challenge the system which does not give, which is designed not to give us the tools to do what we need to do to take care of the temple. The prophet does both. Y'all following me? Together, these three tensions of time, of focus, of audience form the access of prophetic leadership. And the prophet stands at the intersection. And if we are to follow the biblical model, if we are to follow the model of Jesus, there must be a balance between these tensions if the responsibility of the prophetic mantle is to be fully realized. It is tempting and it is right 
to focus on individual issues, to focus on personal holiness. It is it's tempting and it is right to try to get people's lives right and get them to heaven. It is tempting and it is right to encourage people to live in the future and to save their money and to achieve prosperity in their modern day lives. It is tempting and it is right to pursue the eschatological promise of wholeness and newness that appears with the return of the king. It is tempting and it is right, but it is not enough. We are living in treacherous times. We are on the brink of war with a nation that has nothing to lose. We have thousands of children living in cages at the border, separated from their parents, dying of the flu because our government won't give them flu shots. Global warming is wiping out land and people every day. The rich are getting richer while the poor are getting poorer by design. Police abuse of power, white supremacy, racism, and sexism is on the rise. The people in Flint still don't have drinking water. Where is the church? Where are the prophets? It is our job as the people of God. It is our job as prophetic leadership to call out sin wherever sin exists. Sin is a sin, is a sin, is a sin. Whether it's in your bedroom or in the boardroom, it's a sin. Whether it is in the clubhouse or the White House, it's still a sin. Whether it is in City Hall or in your congregations, a sin is a sin. God does not confine us as prophets to one area and say, deal with sin over here and only over here. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We have dominion over the entire earth, and so our voice is not confined. Our God is not confined to one place in time. It, we are derelict in our duty as the church. We are derelict in our duty as prophets when we confine ourselves only to what is happening inside the four walls of our church. Do you see what I see? We are derelict in our duty, and I submit to you that prophets, all of us, need to self-check. And if our ministry is only about more square footage and a bigger congregation and the size of your offering plate and a personal word for a personal situation, we have left half our mantle on the floor. God calls us to, and we have limited God. We have confined God to only caring about our personal situation and not the system that created our personal situation. And I don't know about you, but my God is bigger than that. My God cares about everything that concerns me. The Bible says he perfects that which concerns me. And so if my water is not clean, if my air is not clean, if my children's schools are falling down, if they hot in the summertime and cold in the winter, God cares about that. And it's my job as the prophet. It is my mandate as the prophet of the Lord to speak to that situation. It is not like God, and therefore I must call it out. Y'all with me? Yes, yes. Hallelujah. So I know you're saying, what, I, 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 what should I do? What should I do? Because I want the full mantle of God to be in effect. What's my next step? What, what do I do? I'm going to give you three things. Now, I'm not asking you to make a sign or join a rally or stand on the steps of the White House, although all those are all good things. Here's what I want you to do. Number one, have an analysis. Understand and be conversant in the issues of the day. Read a book besides the Bible. I'm just saying. Read the newspaper. More than one. And not the one with the pictures. Good, good, good. 
When I was a little girl, my father made us read the New York Times. I was eight years old. I didn't know what they were talking about. And the type was small, and it had a lot of columns. But he said, just read it. Read it every day. After a while, you'll get it. And I did. We read the front, and we only had to read the front page. So I read, I was like, I don't know, I don't know where that is, I don't know. I, but I kept doing it and tuned my muscle. Yes, yes, yes. Tuned my muscle to understand what was happening in the world. Read more than one newspaper. The news section, not the sports. Not the funny papers, as we used to call them. Watch something on television besides all white Hallmark. And the Word Network, we shouldn't be watching the Word Network anyway. But you know, we get on TBN, amen somebody. And, and, and listen, to, listen to the white evangelicals tell us about pie in the sky by and by. And, and, and what's the one that he will give you a whole dissertation on the book of Revelation? I'm like, well, when are you going to talk about what's happening right now down the block from your church? Get an analysis. Get informed. We're about to go to war with Iran. Can you find Iran on a map? Our children are about to be drafted into war. The children in your congregations are about to be sent to war with a country most of us can't find on a map. How do you minister to your people about their child being drafted when you don't know where the country is or why we even fighting? You gotta get an analysis of the issues. Now I know this is a challenge, and if you don't know, now don't get on TV talking about something you don't know about. Because then all of us sit there going, oh, Lord Jesus, help her. Why is she on the TV? Who put her on the TV? Because they're always looking for some handkerchief head preacher who don't know what they're talking about to be an embarrassment to the church. If you don't know what you're talking about, get educated. Find a teacher. Call Master Prophet. You can even call me. Explain the issue. I need to understand, not so I can be on TV, but so that I can be equipped and informed and at the bare minimum, know how to pray. Amen. Call the activists in your community, which brings me to my second point. Know the activists in your community. You ought to be able to name the leading voices the frontline leaders, and those who are working on the key issues in your community. Reach out to them. Be in dialogue with them. That doesn't mean you got to show up every time the door swings open. You don't have to be on every month. But you ought to know who they are. The prophets in the Old Testament were able to challenge the kings because they knew the king's name. They were able to get into the palace because they had a relationship, sometimes good and sometimes bad, with the powers that be. Most of us are internal. We stay inside our four walls. We don't know who the leading activists are, and they don't know who we are. Do you remember when Michael Brown got killed in Ferguson? And there was an uprising there, and the people took to the streets, and the activists were calling for investigations, and everybody was going from the round, around the country. You know who wasn't welcome? The preachers. Jesse Jackson got run out of town that day. He was not allowed to speak. You know what? He had no relationship with that community. The ministers of that community went to the front lines because of all things, they want to have a prayer meeting in the middle of the rally, and they got run out of the circle. Because the activists said, the people in the community said, we don't know you. We haven't seen you. We have no relationship with you. You stay inside your church. You want us to come to you. We haven't seen you at the point of our pain, so don't come now to my let's pray. It was a sad day for the church. Because where people are hurting, that is where God is. And be clear, God was there because the people were hurting. But the people who claimed to be the voice of God were not welcome where the people were. Amen. 
you know God's heart was hurt that day. But at the same time, God is saying, well, that's just what, see what you have done. See what you have wrought. So my challenge to you is to go back where you, who are the activists in your neighborhood that serve your community? What are the, can you name the issues that affect the community where your church is, the community where you serve? Do you know what's on the hearts and the minds of people? How do you minister to them if you don't know? And if you do know it, it allows you, A, to know how to pray, and B, to know how to give a word, a relevant word. The third thing I want to challenge to do, you to do is to get in the way. John Lewis, and we want to lift him in prayer as he struggles with uh, the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Congressman John Lewis tells the story of when he was a young man preparing to join Dr. King in the movement, and he was 14 or 15. And after weeks of pestering his parents, who kept telling him no, he was too young, his parents finally relented and gave their permission for him to meet up with Dr. King. And as Mr. Lewis's father was putting him on the bus, he said, well, John, we didn't want you to go, but as long as you're going, Remember to get in the way. It is our job as the people of God. It is our job as the prophet to get in the way. To get in the way of systems that come to destroy the people of God. It is our job to get in the way, to disrupt the pattern that is happening in the lives of our members, whether that is their personal holiness, their personal salvation, their personal place of lack, their personal issues and situations, or whether that is the systemic issues that help to create some of the challenges of the individuals. We come to disrupt the pattern. We come to get in the way. That is our job. And when people see us coming, they ought to say, here they come. They just come in here to mess up my assumptions, my presumptions. They come here to mess up my way of thinking the pattern that I have gotten myself into. They come to critique and criticize where I am and energize me to a new place. They come to get in the way. That's our job. We're not here to go along to get along and to say amen to something that needs to be said hell no to. We come to get in the way. There comes a time when we have to take a stand for what is right, even if it is not expedient, even it is not popular, even when it is uncomfortable, even in when it is not to our immediate advantage, in dire circumstances, God calls us to bear public witness to our faith and the place of primacy that the sovereign God holds in our lives. I always struggled with in the book of Exodus when God tells them to paint the, the blood on the doorposts. And I said to my, I would say to myself, don't God know who his children are? Why they gotta paint blood on the doorposts? Why can't they paint the blood on the inside of the doorposts? Why it gotta be outside? I mean, God is God, he doesn't know who's with him and who's not. Why, you gotta, why we gotta go through all of this for God to know? And then I came to the realization that some things require a public witness. Sometimes God requires us to stand up in a public way. And that's what that blood on the doorpost was. It was a public way of showing I stand with the Most High God. That is the time that we live in today. We can't be prophets hiding in a, in a rock. We can't be hiding by the brook waiting for the manna to fall from heaven. We can't be sitting in the cave hiding from Jezebel. Come on, somebody. This is the time for us to put some blood on the doorposts and say, for God I live, for God I die, I come in the name of the Lord. I am a prophet of the Lord, and I come to proclaim his witness. And if Jezebel wants to kill me, the Jezebel can kill me, but I'm going to go down fighting with the word of the Lord. 
Come on, somebody. We must be a living testimony, a living, breathing, doing testimony of God's principles of love and mercy and peace. And our words and our actions must be a witness to God's justice and God's righteousness. We, the spirit-empowered people of God, should lead the way in any conversation, in any action that is about justice, fairness, and equity. Part of the problem we're having is that these new movements springing up don't have any God center. Because the people of God and the church of the Lord have taken a back seat and allowed secular, non-believing people to lead a movement about God's principles. How you gonna talk about justice and we don't have nothing to say? How are we going to talk about righteousness and the atheists are leading the... Our God is the definition of justice. Our God is the definition of righteousness. It is our place to be at the head of the march. It is our place to be at the head of the conversation. That is what God expects from us. We are the people of God. We are the prophets of the Lord. And the light of God in our lives should cause us to lead and not to follow. To be in the forefront of God's issues, not running to catch the crowd. And when we do that, when we proclaim God's justice, when we lead in the ways of God's righteousness, when we show a new path, we not only provide witness and testimony, we become like the earthquake in Paul and Silas's Roman jail, an earthquake that loosens chains and unbinds shackles and brings freedom to a bound and hurting people and a nation whose dreams have turned to nightmares. We are at a dire place in our nation, at a crossroads of crises few of us could have imagined. There will be, as Dr. King said, some difficult days ahead but we've had difficult days before. And we've survived the horror of the great crossing and the soul-stripping degradation of slavery. We've lived through reconstruction and the Civil War and Jim Crow and internment camps. And we've answered with the abolitionist movement, the suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, Stonewall, the women's movement, the farm workers movement, Black Lives Matter, and so many others. And we've been strengthened by the great cloud of witnesses, those who didn't receive the promises, but saw them, but saw them. Do you see what I see? They saw them and didn't stop believing because their dreams didn't come to pass in their lifetime. Paul and Peter and the Marys, Frederick, Sojourner, Cesar, our grandmothers and grandfathers and countless other ancestors didn't stop fighting for freedom, didn't stop proclaiming the word of the Lord, did for education, for the right to vote, the right to live, the right to be equal, the right to live freely, even though they didn't see it in their lifetimes. But let's be clear, the source of our strength is not in the movements themselves or in the struggle for struggle's sake. The source of our strength is not in the marches or the rallies, or the causes. No, the source of our strength is the source of our lives. It is in God that we live, that we move, and have our being. It is because of God that we have our purpose and our mantle. It is because of God that we move as we move. And so now in this moment, as we battle economic challenges, governmental callousness, and systemic racism, as we fight for freedom and self-determination for our people, as we fight to reclaim our place as the church, to reclaim our full mantle as the prophets of the Lord, as we battle seemingly insurmountable odds to bring change to this country, let us be the church. Let us be God's prophets, declaring the full word of the Lord to a people and a nation that has lost their way. Let us hold forth a vision of God's making, of God's destiny, of God's reign. Let us hold forth a vision of hope. Let us remember and remind people to hope. As the people of God, as the prophets of God, we've been to the future. So we have hope in the belief, in the faith, it's of insurmountable circumstances. And our hope 
is believing despite the odds. Our hope exists regardless of the possibility or impossibility of what, see, of the, what the word is. Our hope comes from the eternal source, the lover of our souls, the, from the giver of strength, from the provider of purpose. So though the fig tree shall not blossom, and though there be no fruit in the vine, though the fields yield no meat, and though the flocks be cut off from the fold, though there be no herd in the stall, I will not worry, and my heart shall not fear. For though some trust in chariots, handmade and man-made things, and some trust in horses, nature and the natural order of things, we will trust in the name of the Lord, we will remember what the Lord has done and where the Lord has brought us from. And therefore, we have hope. And therefore, we have a word. And we have hope that comes not from bottles or pills. It comes not from governmental processes, not from economic systems, and not from court decisions. Not hope from history or forecasting. But our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. God bless you.